you're walking across a rickety bridge. <laughs> a cute graduate student is leading you across, and when you reach the other side, says, I have a picture here. I want you to tell me a story about it. We're testing the effect of the environment on your creativity. So you tell them a story, and they offer you their number saying, if you have any questions, give me a call. So the real question, do you call them for a date? According to the study, you were much more likely to ask them for a date on this bridge than on this bridge. Why do you think that is? You're going across the rickety bridge, you're shaking, your heart is beating, you're breathing kind of quickly, kind of like when you think someone's really hot. You know, the brain has this tendency to take the physiological data that's happening, the neurotransmitters that are flying, and apply it to whatever's in front of it, even if it's incorrect. This is called misattribution, and it happens all the time. Anytime that you are having some strong emotion, you are probably misattributing something. In science, a single event is never conclusive evidence, ever. But since when has the brain been into science? The brain just takes whatever's in front of it, whatever happened, and applies it. This is why Lucky Charms exist. This is why someone needs to wear a jersey for their team to win, because one time it happened, and then it's gonna happen again, right? I have to wear this jersey or they're gonna lose. Or, this is why people who've been in a car accident sometimes are triggered by the sounds of ambulances going by, or the smell of gasoline. There was a traumatic experience. The brain thought, I need to figure out what caused it. Like, where did this come from? And anything that could have happened brings that back that response. Now, there's some specific neurotransmitters that are pretty commonly misattributed. We got dopamine. That's a neurotransmitter of feeling good. That's a bite of chocolate. That's, you know, going for a run, that real feel-good chemical. We got serotonin, the neurotransmitter of comfort. That's, you know, when you don't have enough of it, that's an anxiety disorder, depression, that's aggression and eating disorders, a lot of things that, you know, serotonin can inhibit. And my favorite neurotransmitter, oxytocin. <laughs> oxytocin is the neurotransmitter of love. This happens when you're kissing, cuddling, having sex, having an orgasm, but also when you're giving birth and also breastfeeding. Oxytocin helps you connect with others, whether it's a partner or a child. And by the way, if you laughed at this picture just now, you released dopamine, and you probably misattributed it to me. So you like me more than you did two minutes ago. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I will, there's not a lot of things that release all these neurotransmitters. A lot of things do one or two, but something that does all three is music. Music, that beat that moves you, or that song that makes you kind of want to cry, these are some really powerful things when it comes to the brain. So, I have a little story about misattribution in music. I went on a date in college, I know it's surprising, and I <laughs> wasn't into this girl, just wasn't into her. I, uh, we went to this voice recital of this professor, and it was amazing. You know, we were in the dark sitting there, and this professor's just making us laugh and cry, and this music is just washing over us, and I look over at her and think, you know, maybe I haven't given her a chance. Maybe. I haven't seen her like this before, and I just really like, I realized I misattributed, and I caught myself doing it. And how can we use this to our advantage is my question. So, all right, hands free, everybody. We're gonna clap together. One, two, give me a clap, clap, clap. Very good, up high, up high, down low, down low. This side, this side. And give me a pose, okay. So, what we just did is we, um, we uh, entrain together, we uh, release these chemicals together, and now you like each other more, you like me more, you want to trust me more, you want to help me more. We want to help those more that we've synchronized with. <laughs> Music has this powerful thing, and we can use this to our advantage. Think, when you go to a concert with someone, or when you're at a concert and you're at a festival and you're dancing with all these people and making all this, and all this music is washing over you, you fe leave feeling so close and so connected, but you haven't talked at all. It's because you have these chemicals of connection. You're like, oh, I love this dude, man. But really, it's just a bunch of music and a bunch of, it's a lie. That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> and what about, there's something I like to call musical pre-gaming. This is when you use music before you're doing something you don't really want to do. You're going to a meeting that you're just not ready to present at. You're going to a TED talk you're not ready to present at. You're going to a party you're not in the mood for, you put on some music on the way, you get that dopamine up to help yourself feel good about it, that serotonin up to make yourself comfortable and less anxious about it, and then oxytocin to prepare you to connect with others. What about um, foster care and adoption? 
when you have a family that hasn't had this you know, growing up opportunity to necessarily connect with a child and a family. Could we use the manipulation of oxytocin with music to help people connect that need to connect? What about religion? As long as religion has existed, it has held hands with music. And I think this is why. Because what does religion want to foster but you know, connection with a community, connection with something greater, oxytocin, or comfort, less anxiety, less depression, serotonin, and feeling good, feeling good in that community, dopamine. Religion and music have always been intertwined because of these reasons. Now, I want you to consider for a moment, consciousness is this, if we say that it is the you know, synchronized harmony of firings in the brain and the release of these chemicals that make life really wonderful, then is it possible to suggest that music creates, sustains, and enhances consciousness? So I want you to go home, go to school, go to work, go to your parents, go to your children, go to your community, and use music to enhance those relationships. Use music to reinvent what's going on between you and the people around you, and use music to be a more conscious person. Thank you.